Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Yella, the place where you get your daily dose of inspiration for entrepreneurship. And today we have with us Sumit Sharma, who is the founder of Radian FinServe, which is an NBFC that operates in the domain of gold loans. Hi Sumit, welcome to Yella. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I would uh, request you to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a bit about uh, Radian FinServe. Sure. Uh, so I am, um, um, my name is uh, Sumit Sharma. Um, uh, like you said, I run a company called Radiant Fencer. We started it about two years ago, um, <clears throat> but operationally it's just over a year plus old. And I'll talk a bit about that, what, what I mean by that. Um, but uh, you asked me to introduce myself. So, uh, so briefly, um, I um, have largely spent my uh, working career in bank, banking and financial services. My longest employer was HSBC, with whom I started in India. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. And then worked in various parts of the world, including Hong Kong, London, uh, Jakarta. Uh, I also spent some time in Singapore with DBS Bank before we came back to India about eight, nine years ago. Um, about five years ago, I started uh, a microfinance company with a friend of mine. And that that is continuing. It's doing well. But uh, over uh, of late, I have taken a back seat. Uh, I've given up my operational role there so that I can focus on Radian. Um, we, uh, like I said, we started Radian about uh, two years ago, um, and uh, this 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 organization was started with Sanjeev Haseen, who was my senior colleague and boss in HSBC and DBS. Um, so when he came back to India. Around the same time, uh, we started thinking of it uh, and um, um, came came up with this uh, this thought. We applied to the RBI for uh, the NBFC license, and we got that last October, exactly a year and a few days ago. Um, uh, and that's when we started our operational expansion beyond uh, Bangalore. Uh, so we are based in Bangalore, um, but uh, now present in five states um, across India. That's uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu. Uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Telangana, and Madhya Pradesh. Uh, most of the, in fact, all the expansion beyond uh, Karnataka or Bangalore started in the last year after we got the NBFC license. Uh, so that's that's broadly me. Um, what else? Uh, I think today uh, Radian has about thirty six uh, um, branches. When we started, we had uh, thought of uh, um, going in a pure play digital customer acquisition format. However, we changed that very quickly based primarily on customer feedback. So within three months of our starting, we had moved away from uh, in our strategic positioning or, or our plans from uh, a uh, digital only player to actually setting up uh, physical branches um, because customers really wanted that and that they, they repeatedly mentioned that. And we are glad we did that because it actually makes our um, connect and contact with customers much, much better. And that's what we are currently focusing on. Uh, early days in our journey, but we we feel very good about uh, um, what we have set up and how we are work, um, you know, working on the trajectory uh, of uh, of growth and uh, break even. Got it. We'll, we'll talk more about uh, Radian. Before that, uh, would like to, you know, hear from you about your pre-entrepreneurial journey and especially your childhood uh, how where, where were you born and brought up where did you study and was there a seed of entrepreneurship in you uh, in that phase like uh, you know was there a orientation towards it okay i mean that's that's a tricky question to answer because when you're a child you you you're very um unsure of what uh, you would be so when it's uh, let's let's go back to uh, when i started but uh, you know since you asked me no i didn't think uh, i i don't think i have the entrepreneurial bug or uh, uh, or that desire at uh, when i was a child honestly i didn't know what i wanted to do at that point in time uh, i've grown up in small towns in india uh, my father was a doctor um, and we used to move every 2 3 years um uh, till the time i reached uh, late school and college uh, which is when uh, my father came back from overseas uh, where we had spent some time and uh, uh, we uh, he set up uh, his clinic there. So since then, I, I did my um, latter part of schooling and college in a small town in North India called Ambala. Um, and after that, uh, I moved to um, XLRI uh, to study management. Actually, before before I did that, a um, um, lot, uh, lot of people are very clear in terms of what they want to do. 
And at that time, I thought I was very clear. I wanted to go and become a pilot. And I got selected to the NDA and uh, um, I did very well in the pilot aptitude test. I would have been a cadet, uh, a flying cadet there and so on. Uh, however, I chose not to go there for various reasons, family pressure and so on and so forth. Mm. And to be honest, uh, once I gave that up, I was 17 years at that point in time. I wasn't too sure what to do. So that's when I learned a, a bit about management. It was a new concept at that point in time. Today, of course, everybody knows about MBA. Yeah. Um, I prepared for that and then uh, went to XLRI, like I said. Um, and then on um, my corporate journey be uh, began. I started work with a company called Smith Klein Beecham, um, now known as Glaxo. Um, and uh, this was uh, a, a stint in a very small town in uh, Punjab called Naba, where we used to make Holics. Um, and I, I stayed there and worked there during the peak of the 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 militant movement in Punjab where lots of people were being targeted and gunned down and so on. So it was a very exciting experience. Also shaped me uh, for the future quite well. Made a lot of friends in the cantonment area there who were young officers. Uh, so we, we kind of got along very well. Um, came back to Delhi in the, in the head office for a period of time. And my entire stint in... Um, Glaxo was less than uh, two years, and when, that's when I joined HSBC in Bombay. And since then, I've largely stayed in uh, in financial services. So, like I said, I started in India. After a few uh, two and a half, three years, I went to Hong Kong and then moved around a, a fair bit. Mm. Um, so, I mean, in fact, I I say to people that now we've been in Bangalore for eight years plus, nine years, eight years plus now actually, and this is the longest I've ever stayed in a city in my life. And, and in many ways, uh, um, longest I've stayed in a country as well for uh, ever since I started uh, uh, college. Mm. So uh, we've moved around a lot. Uh, we've we've just recently moved to a new place in Bangalore. So we, we think we have at least partially settled only about a month and a half ago. That's why you'll see behind me there's a lot of, uh, uh, well, maybe I've positioned the camera so that you don't see a lot of mess. But uh, um, we we... We are just about settling in here. And like I said, um, we moved around a lot um, along the way. You know, my, my my kids were born. I've got two children. One was born in Jakarta. The other one was born in Singapore. They're, of course, now both here. But uh, um, they've all grown up uh, in uh, in different places. Wow. Uh, so. so my question here is, uh, why did you, you know, choose to jump into the entrepreneurial path? Like uh, you worked for all good banks like uh, DBS, HSBC. I'm sure they, they these are uh, uh, the companies who pay well uh, to their employees. And you also traveled to multiple cities, London, Jakarta, and Hong Kong. Uh, why did you, you know decide to you know come back to India and you know start on something that is not very sure? Like entrepreneurship is is like the most uncertain thing that you can do. Why? Huh. No, I think that's 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 a very very relevant question, and it's it's very difficult to answer, to be honest, because I've been thinking about it for some time, and it took me quite a long time before I I actually moved away from corporate life. I should have mentioned that after Hong Kong and before London, I took a year off and I went to study in France uh, uh, at a place called INSEAD. INSEAD is one of the better known business schools, yeah. um, and I spent the year there. Um, and since that time, uh, there's been this uh, thought that I should try and do something on my own. Um, in fact, uh, when we used to meet at uh, gatherings, uh, alumni meetings and so on, so pretty much everyone I knew from NCIAD had started something on their own and they used to ask me, you're still working. Uh, so, you know, really that's that's the time it really started. And you asked me if as a child I'd thought about entrepreneurship and the answer is really no, because I'd, I'd not really thought too much about it. But, but since, uh, since that time I've been thinking... And I was lucky in a way to meet a good friend of mine from XLRI when uh, uh, about uh, six years ago when mm -hmm. we started talking about uh, setting something up. And then we both of us quit our respective roles um, in banks and uh, started uh, a microfinance company, like I mentioned earlier. So he he egged me on, and I I you know I think uh, I egged him on. Uh, it we got the comfort and support. Um, and honestly, if if I have to dissect as to how and why it fell into place when it did. Um, there's no magic uh, formula, so to speak, but I, I felt comfortable. Um, like you rightly said, I've been working for reasonably well-established uh, organizations, and we were well looked after across different cities and countries. 
Um, and it becomes more and more difficult as you grow in your career to move away from that comfort. Mm. Um, but I think I also had the support of my family, my wife. Uh, we we were able to um, take that uh, uh, call of moving into a relative unknown, like you rightly said. You don't know what it entails. You don't know how it will go. Um, the failure rates are very high in uh, entrepreneurship and so on. Um, but I think uh, it, it just felt right. I felt comfortable. And uh, so far, it's been a good journey. I mean, my first venture, where Vector Finance in, um, is, is doing very well. Uh, my partner is running it. I've, like I said, moved out, but I maintain my, my um, interest there. And uh, Radian, though it's two years old, it's really one year plus for, for the operations. We've got our license. We are now establishing ourselves. We're doing certain things, right? Of, of course, there's a lot to learn. Um, this is a slightly different space than micro microfinance. We uh, we lend against coal, and uh, it's been a very very steep learning curve, but also a very exciting one. And and I'm I'm actually quite bullish about the future. So, so speaking of failure rate, I think uh, of all the startups I know, or, or rather all the categories I know, I think finance and uh, fintech is the space where the failure rate is less actually because. You know, uh, you you have so many regulations. You have to you know, uh, make sure that you are doing it the right way. So the failure rate reduces. But speaking of uh, gold loan, I think um, this is a space which is you know constantly growing in India. From last few years, more and more players are, are joining, are joining in. And uh, I think there are some traditional players like uh, IFL, Manapuram, and Muthut Finance, and they are also doing well, quite massive uh, asset. Um, quite massive, uh, massive uh, uh, lending they have done. So tell mm -hmm. us what is so different about uh, Radian FinSub? How are you, you know, doing it differently than these players? Sure. Like you rightly mentioned, there's a there's a group of uh, incumbents, uh, three or four, you know, large organizations who have done very well, and they've uh, established branches. They've established physical presence. Um, uh, some of the bigger ones have more than 5,000 branches across the country. Uh, and over a period of time, they've developed uh, a brand, a trust of people and so on and so forth. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's working very well. Year on year, they've been delivering great results. Uh, equally, there's a clutch of new organizations, the fintechs, as you rightly said, um, who have come in and provided uh, the same offering at a slightly different, uh, um, sort of in a slightly different setting where uh, there are no branches, but they come home and everything is done through a digital uh, channel. And in fact, like I mentioned, we had also thought of being in that bucket when we started, but we pivoted very quickly. Um, so we are not at neither extreme. I mean, if you look at uh, one extreme of uh, branch only model and the other one is only digital, we are somewhere in between. So we have branches, we, we use digital channels, um, we, uh, digital channels. Uh, we go to customers' houses and provide doorstep uh, offering and so on. So there's a... Uh, the, I mean, we. I think till till some time ago, we were the only one who had uh, who had taken that approach, and we want to you know deepen our customer relationship and so on and so forth. I also man maintain that ultimately, gold loans is a commoditized offering. At the very fundamental level, you take the gold and you give the money, um, and at the end of the loan tenure, you reverse the cycle. And of course, there's an interest element and mm -hmm. so on and so forth goes on during this period. So, you know, you can pull all, put all the bells and whistles, you can bring in the technology, you know, glamorous apps and functionality and so on and so forth. But the basic offering remains unchanged. Just like if you think of a bank, you know, most banks have a fairly standard offering. Some are good at technology, some are good at customer relations, some may be good at a specific product and so on and so forth. But ultimately, the basic offering remains the same. Similarly, I don't know, a hotel. Ultimately, uh, hotels provide you a standard service. Some may have great food. Some may have great uh, ball ballroom type uh, places for conferences and so on. But the basic offering remains. So I think we we uh, I would I would go back to the default uh, to the default that we it is a commoditized offering. Within that, uh, we are trying to use uh, customer connect technology and the branch presence as a combination as against one or the other which uh, has typically been done. And so far, um, while it's early days and we are still very small, um, uh, there's reason to believe that that seems to be working. Um, and uh, we have the right uh, um, trajectory that we have found ourselves on. And one thing we are very keen on in, is to build a sustainable business. 
Now, no business owner would say that we don't want to build a sustainable business, but uh, uh, where we have gone uh, uh, at a slight difference is, you know, we are bootstrapped. We have not taken any um, major funding or institutional investment at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Between Sanjeev and I, we put in uh, our initial savings and then we've taken some amount of money from friends and family, but we've not taken huge chunks of money. So we, our resources are limited. And that's also taught us to uh, work within the means and and try and use our resources more productively. So we, we are not uh, um, spending huge amounts on branding or promotion or advertising or uh, really creating products uh, we, which may attract customers, but we, which we don't build a sustainable business model for us. So we've tried to stay away from that. And again, since you asked how we different, I think we have approached it slightly differently. Um, and uh, uh, in 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 so far our fiscal prudence and acumen is is concerned. Uh, having Sanjeev as a as a partner is is brilliant here because he's very seasoned. He uh, provides great counsel and uh, advice and guidance, and doesn't allow us to go beyond uh, the script uh, that we have created for ourselves. And you know, it, it's a it's a degree of pride that we mentioned that we, of course, we still have to break even. It's early days, but we are doing. Uh, very well in terms of our projections, and next year sometime we should be um, should be uh, sort of talking about how we are making profits, which I would I would say is is much faster uh, than many uh, organizations who tend to choose of a, a growth only path. So we're growing slower, but we're growing in a sensible manner. So I don't know if that answers your question about how we are different, but uh, those are those are my attempts at mentioning. Um, one other thing, um, uh, I'm conscious of time, but um, um, we believe that uh, our capability for execution and scaling up is has been proven and we are good at it. Um, whether it is Sanjeev and me or the core team that uh, uh, that has that we have been lucky to have have us uh, have joined us, um, we all have fairly good exposure and experience in building and scaling organizations, especially distributed organizations. And that's something that is helping us um, as far as execution of the uh, of the of this is concerned, and we think it'll hold us in good stead. <clears throat> Speaking of exposure and experience, I think uh, many of the fintech startups uh, that come up, the founders come from a background of finance. They have either you know spent their good ten years time in different banks or fintechs to understand the space and. You know, there are so many intricacies like you have to, for opening up a NBFC, you have to get a license and, you know, do a lot of things before you can, you know, start your operations. Having uh, said that, can you give us a, you know, perspective of how do you set up a NBFC for a newbie who doesn't know about, you know, anything uh, related to finance or the people who are just interested in entrepreneurship, but they don't know uh, what it takes to open a uh, fintech company. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, give an example of yeah. your initial days, like how, what kind of hirings that you did initially, or you know, uh, what all activities that you did to set up this venture. Sure. Um, I mean, you 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 made the point earlier that fintechs generally tend to be tend to do well because they're largely in a regulated space, and RBI doesn't uh, or the regulator. Uh, whether it's SEBI or RGI um, or reinsurance um, and so on. Um, they don't uh, allow you to go too far away from the script, so to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, there are certain broad guidelines. And I think that that really helps. Um, and NBFC in particular is is a regulated entity. I mean, you have to apply for a license. Uh, there are There's a fairly detailed process around it. Um, and uh, as an NBFC, we are governed by the RBI, we audited by the RBI on a, on a, on a, on a periodic basis and so on. Um, and uh, as against the broad fintech family where, you know, you, you may be just uh, uh, an aggregator, mm -hmm. um, not just an aggregator, aggregator is a big, big play. In fact, bigger than NBFCs in many ways, but uh, you're not regulated by the, um, by the um, Central central bank in the same manner as an NBFC is regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, to to the point that you're making as to how how do you set it up? I mean it's uh, it's it's a very personal thing in terms of what you wish to build and uh, the kind of organization that you wish to build. So I mean speaking for ourselves, Sanjeev and I have both been uh, 
in large organizations and we've come uh, like you rightly pointed out from a relatively structured and regulated environment and that i think is is playing into the ethos of the company that we are building in i also have a background in in microfinance where i'd set, set up a microfinance company before radian and uh, distribution setup and so on and i think that also played in our approach and decision to actually go for a distribution setup rather than a pure play digital um, um, uh, setup or digital acquisition. Um, while the latter, the digital sounds more glamorous and is certainly more exciting in the current scheme of things in terms of technology and so on, mm. uh, we feel that uh, uh, being out there and having a physical presence branch or out outlet, whatever you want to call it, actually helps us a lot. Maybe it is more traditional, but it actually works. So, so some of those things are there. Those are very personal choices uh, that the founders make. Um, you asked me about uh, how do how do you go about setting up an organization, and that's a, I don't think there's a template uh, for it, but uh, I can speak about how how we did. Yeah. First of all, when Sanjeev and I started speaking about it, um, our you know honing into what specific things that we want to do, neither of us us uh, had known much about gold to be honest at that point in time but we read we 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 did our research we were very excited about uh, what we saw and found out first of all i mean i, I don't know if you know india has the largest uh, uh, amount of gold largest uh, quantities of gold sitting in our households mm. uh, much much bigger than any other country um I, I don't if if you look at uh, us which is the largest in terms of sovereign gold holdings they us holds about eight eight and a half thousand tons of gold in um, the sovereign holding india's sovereign holding is much less but uh, we have something like between 26 to 28 thousand tons of gold sitting in wow. our houses which like i said is by far bigger than mo any other country not most other country any other country so, so there's a lot, and the market's pretty huge. If you look at the incumbents in the lending industry, gold loan industry, um, they probably hold less than 1,000 tons amongst all of them put together. Uh, so there's a huge amount uh, that is still out there. A lot of it will not come back, come out because, you know, some people yeah. will, will not want to take it and so on. But there are very limited and very unidimensional way of thinking around gold loans at this point in time. Typically, it is seen as uh, a little, little bit of a last resort. When you don't have anything else, you go and pledge your gold. It is seen, mm. if people look down upon um, pledging gold. How could you take your ornaments and, and give it to somebody else? You know, is, is it that desperate a time? And so on and so forth. Mm. Increasingly and encouragingly, we are seeing uh, a move towards uh, planned um, move of such gold, you know, planned pledging of the gold, if I may use that. Uh, so we see farmers who, at the start of the crop cycle, bring out their gold, take the money, um, get the seeds or whatever is needed during that period. Uh, and five, six months later, once the crop is, uh, the harvest is done, they, you know, play the cycle backwards and get their gold back. Um, so we've come up with the slogan, gold loan is smart. I think gold loan is good, has been used um, in, in the past as well. Uh, we want to actually move towards uh, making gold loan a smart choice. A lot of people, a lot of my friends, uh, colleagues, and so on will have uh, gold but have never really thought of taking a, a gold loan. Why? Because it never really occurs. Equally, yeah. you know, most most of us uh, would be very happy to take a mortgage on the house because that's seen as a smart thing to do. So there is there are elements that uh, that need to be to, to be worked on. But again, I, I digress. Um, uh, we were talking about how we were looking to set up. So we we looked at some of these aspects. And then we when we tried to define what we want to be, not in one or two years, but what but in 15 years. So Sanjeev and I regularly talk about um, what we wish the organization to become 10 years from now, from 15 years from now. So we're not playing a short-term game and uh, uh, where we just flip the organization after or or change the course and so on um, after two years or three years and so on. So we've, we've, again, partly because of the background and the number of years that we've worked, we are looking at uh, building a long-term sustainable organization. Um, when we tried to set up, we obviously did our own maths, uh, you know, how, what are the risks, how difficult is it? And there is no right template for that. Um, I mean, some people say the sooner you start, the better. Some people say, okay, get to a level of uh, comfort where you think you can take the risk and absorb the risk uh, and the potential of failure. Mm. Um, I'm not the not one to say which is right or wrong. 
it's a very, very personal and individual choice. I know people who have tried their hand at multiple things, one after the other, till the time they find something um, they, they are good at or they succeed at, um, having failed multiple times along the way. Those failures teach you a lot of lessons. Some have jumped in headlong into something. Some have taken a very measured approach and so on. Um, so, I mean, it's very difficult for me and I, I would not be presumptuous to say that this is one right approach to do. Um, it depends on individuals. Like I said, in my case, I had been thinking of it for some time, but the comforts of a role make it more difficult. Um, comforts of a good job make it difficult. And then, of course, there is that fear of a unknown that you had also alluded to. Yeah. But having done this, I'm very glad that I did it. Um, and sometimes I do think that I may I should have done this sooner. But uh, we are where we are. And uh, I'm very happy with the way things are now progressing. <laughs> Any big challenges that you have faced while building and growing this venture? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, uh, when you are a small organization and you are in a relatively, um, I won't say crowded market, but uh, a, a marketplace where a lot of big names operate, um, when, when, I, when I'm trying to hire, it's not the easiest of tasks to get uh, people excited. There are some who get very excited and those are the folks who are working with us in the core core team because uh, they're also taking the same um, level of, uh, how should I put it, risk or punt, if you, if, if I may use that word, and looking, looking at the long-term play around the excitement of building a company, of creating something and so on. Uh, yet, when you look at uh, large teams, we have like 220 plus people now. Um, uh, more often than not, people are really looking at the brand and what career paths might be available and so on. So that becomes, in the initial stages, a challenge. I'm glad to say that we are getting out of that. Now, we have got out of that. Our name is now begin, begin to become visible. I think uh, getting good team uh, is always a challenge, and we did struggle. Uh, we continue to struggle occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one aspect. Second is... Um, when you're small and you don't really have a an umbrella of comfort from a from a big brother or a head office or that kind of stuff, um, you really have limited resources. Like in our case, we, like I said, uh, we don't have a huge uh, amount of funds available, mm -hmm. so we have to work within our resources and make make them work. So it, sometimes you 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 miss the comforts of large organizations and everything that comes along with it. I mean, take. I used to lead a support function. I had a team of more than 200, um, a personal secretary, an assistant, and so on and so forth, people to help you do research and so on. Today, everything has to be done by myself. And uh, um, and various, various variants of that in your professional and personal life. And that's that's something that you need to be comfortable with. And therefore, that's why a lot of people, if they do it very early on in their, uh, early on in their career, before they get used to the trappings of uh, um, corporate comforts, yeah. um, I, I guess it's easier. But again, there's no template. I mean, there's no right way of doing it. I I'm, I can just talk about what I went through. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm very glad that um, I did it. My final question, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I would like to ask you, what what is the meaning of entrepreneurship for you? How would you define entrepreneurship or who is an entrepreneur as per you? I mean, first, for, first and foremost, uh, an entrepreneur needs to have a a vision. And again, my answers would be through the prism of my experience and understanding of how things have been and what what I have felt through. So, I by no means I claim that these are, um, you know, gospel or truth or whatever. But it's just something that I feel feel strongly about. Um, so to to try and do something, I think it's a very important to have a view and a vision as to what is it that you're trying to achieve. Um, I know there are a lot of people who who have tried let's uh, to 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 launch an organization or launch a service because they want to do something rather than having a fairly clear view about what is it that they want to achieve. So that's point number one. Second, I would say is that it's always good to think long term. I know in this day day and age of instant gratification, people think of successes and um, you know huge. Uh, uh, celebrities uh, that uh, that come out of um, such such events, um, you know, people want to be there in two years, three years, and mm. by all means, some people uh, we, we we should we should aspire for that. But reality is that uh, a good 
um, organization build up takes a little longer than that. Um, of course, there might be exceptions and successes uh, that that will come through. But um, so so if you think long term and therefore have the patience to be able to do that. So that's that's the second one. Third to me is entrepreneurship makes you very, very, how should I put it, um, alone in the world, so to speak. So you have to deal with everything yourself um, as against uh, having the comfort and support of multiple people around you and so on. So today, you know, you know, when when we had just started, of course, we were not we were not poorly funded because we we put in our our savings and so on. But we've never really had the comfort or luxury of having huge pools of money. Um, so every time we have to make the salary, we need to ensure that uh, our finances are managed properly. We pull out money from X, Y, and Z and and, and do that. Um, so you, today we are 220 people and growing. Um, so all those folks have a their future um, and their aspirations tied to what we do. And that's a huge responsibility. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, you, you have to be able to um, have that conviction of, of thought and confidence. Um, and the fourth thing I would say is that the ups and downs that happen. So sometimes, some days I feel I'm the king of, of the world in terms of you know what we are achieving, brilliant, you know, nothing can stop us and so on. And a few days later, I'll be down in the dumps because of something not working out. And again, you have to deal with that yourself. Very limited support, if any, coming from uh, elsewhere. And uh, with with the team and so on, You know that they need to be um, seeing the positive way forward so it's 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 tricky and it comes with a huge amount of responsibility as I, as we found out um if some people relish that and and get excited by that some may stay try, try to stay away like i keep saying you know at the cost of multiple repetitions it's a very very personal thing but but those are the sorts of things that come to mind when you ask me what does entrepreneurship um mean to you in the end if it works i think it's it's a phenomenal uh reward just to have created something uh, apart from the successes that might come with it but ultimately you're creating something which i think is the biggest reward yeah even if you don't uh, even if you fail also it's a learning and you know that's uh, that learning that you cannot get elsewhere it's a, a life changing learning uh, of on, course yeah. on this note uh, i think we'll uh, close the session thanks for joining us sumit it was a pleasure to have you on our platform and our best wishes for Adrian Prince, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your time.